afternoon. No? Um, my talk is titled This American Taste, and it explores no, um, the culinary education of young women during the American period. Now, I'd like to preface that this is preliminary research. I think I've, a part of me wanted to do an extensive research of this last year, but because of our wonderful um, situation right now and with a lot of libraries closed now, it's difficult for me to continue this research. So I'm basically working with the resources that I currently have. You know? um, as mentioned earlier, now, I'm very much interested um, in what young women do and the power that young women have in culture. You know? So this paper was greatly inspired by my personal passion for cooking and my encounters with fascinating writings on food during the American period, such as the works of Feliz Santa Maria, Rene Urquiza, um, and Nick Joaquin, and many others. Um, and in reading their work, I crossed primary sources that helped shape you know, um, the cooking literacies of Filipinos, specifically young women. It is no surprise that domestic education, such as housekeeping and cookery, has always been taught to women. Following existing practices in home economics in Western countries, the Americans followed suit and used housekeeping as an avenue to build the literacies of Filipino women. This presentation looks closer you know, um, into the cookery instructions found in various materials used by teachers during the American period. And I wanted to ask, how did American cookery instruction of young, of young Filipino women during the American period change our food culture practices? The sources that um, I analyzed for this, you know, I wanted to look extensively at the different textbooks that uh, were accessible to the students and to the teachers at the time. There were around seven that were mentioned, but I only managed to access two. You know? um, on a regular semester, we would have easy access to these materials. You know? um, in Ateneo, the American Historical Collection in the Ateneo Library of Women's Writing has a very rich collection of cooks, cookbooks and education magazines during the American period. Um, uh, in Aliu, no, there's um, in fact even not just education magazines, but even women's magazines no, that were collected no, by um, some of our writers, no, female writers. No. But sadly, no, the pandemic really pushed this research aside. No, and, I present here primarily what I currently have and the secondary text no, that I currently have on hand. And um, most of my primary sources were accessed by uh, archive.org and the Hathi Trust Digital Art Archives. No? With the Hathi Trust Digital Archives having a much more difficult access because you need a US VPN to access it. No? Um, so if you're interested in tapping that, make sure that you have access to a virtual private network now. And um, I primarily did no, qualitative analysis of these cookbooks, its lessons, recipes, while aligning them with different critical points now from secondary sources that have examined this period. No? Um, in line with these sources, now, I'd just like to preface that the education textbook that I am primarily analyzed now, um, were designed as a teaching guidebook for teachers. No? Um, the first book was written, the one you can see here, was written by Alice M. Fuller. She's an American, American educator assigned to Kigarao, and she published this housekeeping manual or this housekeeping guidebook um, in 1911. And then there was a subsequent book that was written by Susie M. Butts in 1919. No? So of these two editions, Butts would share that she received a fair amount of input no, from local educators in order to update Fuller's work. And I'll discuss that in greater detail later on. No? Um, but in general, these manuals are for the teachers. They're basically telling them what they, what they wish to teach, they, what they wish the teachers to teach to students. Um, but the recipes and other guides no, can be used by students during their classes. No. And Part of my work looks into literacies. Now, um, while I've analyzed quite a lot of queer cultures and the transformative literacies that they practice, um, in, this, in this particular paper, in this particular presentation, I want to use the framework um, used in new literacy studies called liberating literacies. Now. Um, 
this was uh, held or this was penned by James Paul Gee. Um, and I'd like to note that the literacy D mentions here does not involve reading or writing competences alone, but rather literacies that allow us to navigate different communities of interest. Literacies that allow people of a specific community to verbally or non-verbally communicate ideas relevant to their group. No? And these literacies also allow people outside of the community of interest to engage with that specific community. No? And I find this particular quote no, from James Paul Gee to be quite interesting because he tried to look at literacy as a powerful tool no, to critique other discourses. No? And in this particular uh, presentation, I'm interested with the ways in which cooking literacies serve as an entryway for young Filipino women to engage with America's growing empire and American culture. And in learning these cooking literacies, these women were equipped with skills not just to understand America's agenda no, in our country, but also use it as a tool to challenge the colonialization of their home. And as such, I argue that their exposure to American cookery literacies led not just to the development of what some may think as colonial mentality, but rather an opportunity to develop liberating literacies. And we'll analyze these literacies now through four different areas. We'll look at um, how they are embedded in our understanding of resources, technologies, techniques, and tastes. No? Um, but before we enter now into this thing, uh, to this section, I'll just like to give a background on our food culture before the Americans. No? Um, when the Americans arrived, no, we were already exposed to diverse food cultures all over the globe. Sorry. And our food practices depended on one's equipment meals with proper table settings were limited no, to the homes of Spanish and Caucasian migrants and well-to-do locals. As seen in this illustration by Jose Lutano, communal dining has been our thing no, since the Spanish period and even before that. No? Um, but because this image no, came from the Spanish period. Now, this showcases now that um, this food practice now has been with us by the time the Americans arrived. No? And this calendaria you know, uh, showcases a food practice that we still do today, no? the turo turo. Um, this image also showcases some of our important food practices, which includes the consumption of rice with viands and, of course, eating with our hands. Um, we were already a growing global marketplace by the time the Americans arrived. No? And um, we were part of an important trade route between our region, the Pacific, and Europe. We do have European and Western goods. However, many of these are considered luxuries. No? Um, many of them were only found within some, no? were found within intramuros or in very um, urban areas, no? um, or urban cities like Cebu or um, Haro and so on. No? Um, what's interesting even is if you want lower quality goods, items made in Japan were considered cheap items, no? They're the equivalent of a made in China during this period. No? Um, and in terms of food products, no? we did have ice plants in our country, but none were dedicated as cold storage. No? One of our colleagues, um, Nicola Ludovici, had just recently published a uh, article on ice plants no, and its value in food preservation during the American period. No. So you can see that um, we had only limited imported food products because we had limited storage te technologies by the time the Americans arrived. No. Um, but to say that we had a very limited palette, that was not the case either. No. Um, as part of different trade and migrant routes, Filipinos were exposed to various flavors all over the globe. No? Within elite homes and walled city, European and Spanish dishes were fairly common. No? Other migrants, such as the Chinese, have also introduced us our food, no? as seen in this image by Lozano. It's called the Pancitetero. No? In the southern part of our islands, dishes rich in spices and coconut were fairly shared no? among locals and traders who traveled between what we know now as Indonesia, Brunei, and Malaysia. So just to summarize, no? Basically, when the Americans kept on saying that, oh, um, the Philippines were quite backward during this period, that wasn't really the case. No? We actually had a very rich 
food culture by the time the Americans arrived. No? But of course, the Americans arrived on our shores with a lot of biases. No? Um, they were very critical about our lifestyle. They found it unsanitary. Many travelogues would describe our country as backward. And many diaries no, would include the frustrations of many who were trying to access goods that reminded them of home. No? And as some of you have heard no, from your history classes, you know, our backwardness fueled Americans to be benevolent. No? Um, and they felt it was their duty no, to lead us towards civilization. No? Um, while we physically felt their prowess through the Philippine-American War, American schools no, became a cultural battlefield that flaunted the superiority of American culture. No? Um, and with that, when the Americans surrounded their shores, they established public education with the Education Act of 1901. No? Um, Basically, with the Education Act of 1901, they wanted to introduce general education no, to the masses. They, these kids need to be uh, educated in English, the sciences, and so on and so forth. No? However, in 1909, it, the direction of this education changed and shifted no, towards industrial skills. No? So it's not just about teaching these students science, reading, and writing, and arithmetic, but it's also now teaching them trade skills. No? So, um, and scholars now have looked into this curriculum and realized that it's a very gendered curriculum. No? Men were um, asked to develop the skills trade. They were uh, focused on health and domestic work. No? And that includes cooking. No. Um, here is a page, I'm quite sorry if it's quite long, no, but here's a page no, from Housekeeping, a textbook for girls in the public intermediate schools of the Philippines. No. Um, and I'd like to just point out the interesting irony no, of this education plan. No. So we have a lot of public documents talking about the need to civilize the Filipinos, to educate them um, in this civilized, uh, to, to, to be as civilized as the Americans. No? Um, and here you have an interesting irony, no? because in this housekeeping book um, that was distributed to many teachers no? um, teaching in various schools all over the Philippines, there's this interesting paragraph. No? The girls must not feel that domestic science or home economics or whatever this branch of study may be called is a name for the process of forcing them to adopt American customs. No? The basis of a nation's welfare is in its home life, and no nation can be powerful which has not the right kind of homes. No? Homes consist of individuals who, taken together, compose the nation. And unless these individuals are healthy and happy, they do not make desirable citizens. No? Health and happiness depend upon everyday conditions in home. Girls are to be the homemakers and must therefore be taught all those things which will enable them to be their responsibilities. No. And the reason why I wanted to show this paragraph from this page no, in uh, this housekeeping manual is one, despite this agenda no, of colonialization and um, this notion of American mentality, we have to understand that some of the teachers did not exactly feel um, forward in putting this American agenda in this country. No? They were very much thinking about the whole. No? Um, but that said, no, there were still some, I will also explain the um, ironies of this because even while they said this, no, iterations of the book no, and various practices that were taught in the book really relied on American cooking practices. No? And, but because you have that first, this first line no, from this paragraph, no, it became like this, how do you say, a gray area or a loophole that later on Filipino educators will use in order to have a better you know, um, cookery uh, classes. 
So as I said, my the focus of my paper is on these cookery classes. No? And they varied from school to school because, of course, school in an urban area would have different access to materials compared to a school in a rural area. No? They promoted healthy cooking practices. And one thing interesting no, um, in the housekeeping books is that they've always advised the girls that the cookery class is basically there to uh, supplement, to help girls learn how to plan a meal and at the same time whatever they cook it will supplement a meal you no know, for them or for their family you know? so for example in the fuller book they would talk about um basically the cooking class has to be held um at the time where they're going to prepare for the next meal of the girl you know? so for example if the cooking class was in the morning then that means whatever they're preparing is for lunch you know, and or for supper you know, and they can bring um, whatever they cook back home you know? um, and eventually you know, in later cookbooks um, they even have notes that encourage parents and relatives you know, to take part in observing these cookery classes and, and this is mostly to you know, encourage these cooking literacies at home you know? and many of these literacies were really designed to promote healthy cooking practices, no? of course, because the Americans wanted to build a healthy nation for the Philippines. No? So now let's look closer, no? to, uh, let's cl look closer in these cookery classes by examining no? their resources. No? Um, in terms of human resources, we know we have our American educators and the Filipino educators. No? Um, what's interesting is that the American educators were part of the 1901 education um, policy, you know, um, which demanded that English and all of these classes should be taught first you know, by an American educator. And eventually these American educators would train Filipino students. You know? And that worked for a while, you know, but then they were efficient in planning and enacting different kinds of education policies. But the problem with these American educators was that they were a temporary presence in our culture. No? So some would be assigned for maybe would or would come with a two-year, three-year uh, project, or sorry, not project, a uh, three-year immersion, so to speak. Um, and then they'll eventually return to the United States, write a wonderful memoir about the Philippines, and you know, develop other textbooks along the way. Now, that's what happened to Mary Fee. You know? um, but Filipino educators, unlike the American educators, were a constant presence no, in our society. They were the recipient of this public school education. Many of them learned through these schools. Um, some are graduates of Philippine Normal Schools Home Economics Program. And one thing interesting is that they used their education to critique America's culinary pedagogy. Um, and we will see parts of that later on. No? Um, in terms of resources, no, the home, or sorry, the school kitchen heavily relied on school gardens and markets. No? And they would have accounts of teaching students, no? you should visit their market every, um, when the opportunity comes, try to take note of how unsanitary they are and how can they be better no? in terms of their hygienic practices. No? But the school garden was a critical resource no, for home economics. This is where they would get the ingredients no, for uh, the different dishes that they were going to cook for their class. No? And they often contained local fruits, herbs, and vegetables, and even plants that you don't have to eat, but nonetheless use no, for the kitchen. So one of the fun lessons that I learned no, from this is a plant called is is. Now, I didn't know what the plant, what that plant was, no? And um, what's interesting is that it's, I know the, the verb is is, no? is, is is basically to scrub, no? And frankly, we have a plant named is is because it's the one that's used to scrub pots and pans um, back then. And it was indicated in this um, housekeeping book no? from the Fuller and the Buds edition. And they also had those accessible in these school gardens, no? Um, eventually, when the school system focused on um, industrial skills, they also started to develop it, to start to develop industrial crops such as corn. No? And so, at one point, one of their 
corn ingredients. No? We're the ones we list the asset students to focus on were on these industrial crops. No? Um, the coming of Americans, we also had an influx of imported goods. No? Um, we had better accessibility to imported products, and it reflects no? in our uh, in those two educational cookbooks no? that I mentioned. Um, many of those cookbooks would note the use of canned meats and produce, flour and other baking items such as baking soda, and milk and butter. No? Um, and again, I think some of you may already see some problems in this, no? because if your, your school is not within the trade route no? of these products, you probably would not have access to these goods. No? Um, and so these imported goods no, were limited to urban areas and maybe suburban areas. No? Um, but at least with the first cookbooks, no, most of them contain these imported products. Um, of course, many of these imported products no, were incorporated into our local life. No? And they were advertised in such a way that they tried to encourage Filipino people to make these imported, imported products a part of their lives. No? So for example, here you have Jacob's Biscuits saying that you know rather than preparing all of these cakes, just buy a tin of Jacob's Biscuits for your every uh, gathering. No? Um, and here on the right side, we have an advertisement for Quaker Oats. No? Um, Quaker Oats, um, Coke Oats, no? where some of the recipes um, included no? in in the housekeeping guidelines, no? but if you eat oats, you pretty much know that there's only a few, there are a few ways no? that you could eat oats. No? Um, and so it was an interesting incorporation no? of imported food into our lives. No? Um, and of course, in schools, no? um, local schools, at least um, in 1911, when Fuller developed her first book on housekeeping, somehow they were stocked like American pantries. No? I'm not saying that they didn't have local vegetables, but when you start looking at the recipes, many of them needed flour. They had recipes for sandwiches, no? and those sandwiches needed um, baking soda um, for quick breads. They needed um, they needed things like mayonnaise and so on, although there are recipes for mayonnaise. No? Um, but many of the recipes involved a lot of imported products. Thin salmon was there, cold cuts were there. And so um, a lot of teachers no, who were using the Fuller book was starting to question, can we actually cook with these kinds of ingredients? No? Um, and I think for a while they tried, but it was clear by 1916 no, with the account of this Filipino educator in Leyden named Genevieve Aliamas. No? Um, she wrote an essay in the Philippine Craftsman saying that the recipes included in their domestic science cookbooks did not have ingredients that were easily available in the Filipino home. No? These weren't even foods that were eaten in a Filipino table. No? And she added that the use of imported foods in these recipes prevented people from using local ingredients, no? which was more accessible and cheap to many. No? And this um, insight no, did not go unnoticed because in the 1919 edition of Housekeeping um, by Susie Butts, no? Um, they vastly changed their approach to cookery. No? There was now a wider array of um, vegetables um, and ingredients used in recipes. Substitutes were used. So you can see in this picture now you had kamote, gabi, potatoes, bread, cornmeal, rice, and flour. No? And so before it, you'd probably see a lot of recipes containing flour and cornmeal, but now rice. No? Um, not actually rice, but more so Kamote Gabi no? um, recipes were included. No? Um, there were also substitutes used. No? Um, one of the things I noticed in the first book by Fuller, um, a lot of the recipes outlined that you can use milk. And when I first read that, I was wondering what kind of milk it, will any milk do? No? But then 
latter recipes would say you can substitute it for coconut milk. No? And so I think they had a fuller had a clear idea on what milk she wanted, no? um, which would be cow's milk no? from the United States. But later on, it was clear that that kind of milk was inaccessible. And so by the time um, this edition of housekeeping came, no? they already clearly outlined what kind of milk should you use. Coconut milk, you can use carabao's milk or evaporated milk. No? Um, there were also interesting no, recipes um, that used olive oil. No? So for example, in the Fuller book, they had French dressing as part of their stable. No? Um, uh, in fact, one of my favorite dishes that I want to try is this banana leaf salad, uh, sorry, banana heart salad with French dressing, no? um, which as a combination I did not imagine I would try, but apparently it was a thing. And but by the time the bots edition came, gone were those fancy sauces, no? um, and dressings that used olive oil and flour. No? Instead, um, rather than salad, no, um, they were replaced with easy and um, sauteed vegetable dishes. No? Now let's look into another aspect that I wish to tackle: no? literacy surrounding food technologies. No? Um, when I read through the books, no, um, it usually begins with what does a kitchen need? No? And they went full gamut, no? the inclusion of many tools and items present no, in an American kitchen. In fact, I remember reading Fuller's um, book and she insisted that there should be a separate school or separate space no, for domestic science, no? um, ideally. No? And that the kitchen should be equipped no, with this, uh, with basically a zinc lined or zinc covered table. No? And I had to Google what's that table. No? And apparently, this is the standard kitchen table, no? the, sti uh, the steel table no? that many of us would see in professional kitchen. Um, and one thing interesting there is that um, they were suggesting all of these American tools and American, like here you have muffin pans, cast iron pans, and that would have not been easily available no, in many Filipino homes. No. In the fuller edition of the book, things like stoves no, and ovens were frequently mentioned, no. for example, for every baking uh, recipe, no, um, because baking was highly encouraged by the Americans. No. Um, and cakes and so on, uh, they would require the use of ovens. And so I was asking what kind of ovens did they need? No? Um, but one thing, one thing interesting no, is they were introducing new cooking technologies in schools. No? But not only were they introducing these new cooking technologies, they were also introducing how to use these new cooking technologies safely. No? So this is a blue, blue flame petroleum stove, no? which is what we would know now as Kalan. No? Um, and again, this kind of new technology would have been available in an urban area, but not necessarily no, in a home, a Filipino home or a rural area where wood and charcoal fueled stoves and ovens were the norm. No? Um, by the time um, Susie Butts wrote her housekeeping edition, ice boxes were already, uh, I guess, accessible but not common no, in the Philippines. No? Um, I think this, this ran um, in parallel with the different ice plants that were being um, developed or were being built all over the country and hence ice boxes no, became accessible. No? Um, and what's interesting is that the recipe book no, um, or at least with, uh, sorry, this housekeeping manual would include instructions no, on how to use ice boxes um, and why you should use them. No, and it allowed the storage for ingredients longer for butter, milk, and meat. Um, and then because you now have access to ice boxes, you can create recipes no, for cool desserts, ice desserts, and so on and so forth, which is kind of fun no, thinking about making ice cream no, in the middle of the tropics. No? Suddenly that was possible because of these ice boxes. No? But again, this was limited to commercial areas, select schools and homes of privileged foreign and local individuals. No? Um, 
one of the technologies no, that I also found fascinating no, was a fireless cooper. No? And I was like, well, is that a thing? No? And I wasn't familiar like in my entire um, understanding no, of different kinds of food histories. No? I've encountered, no, um, for example, cooking techniques where you put something in uh, under on, on, under the earth, cover it, and let it cook, no? But I didn't imagine, or I didn't think that they would have something like the fireless cooker you know, um, available or promoted here in the Philippines. No? So basically, a fireless cooker looks like this, no? It's basically a box, and um, that box is filled with hay, grass, paper, whatever you have, no? That's non-flammable, that can insulate heat for a long time. And what you would do, as you can see in this image, no, we basically prepare whatever dish you have, um, let's say rice, put it to a boiling point, and then place it inside this empty part no, of the fireless cooker. No. Just put this part. No. You just place your rice there, and then you close the lid no, or cover your fireless cooker. No, and wait for it to cook for like 20 minutes. No? And I thought, wow, that's actually a nice and smart and fuel efficient way no? um, to basically cook dishes. No? And here's um, a picture no, of how they did that in the Philippines. No? This is from um, Butt's book again no? on how you can build no, your own um, fireless cooking uh, a fireless cooker, no, at home. No. Um, but what's interesting is that um, or maybe it's because I haven't read enough resources, and perhaps this is an opportunity for me to look deeper into it. No, I wasn't sure whether this was applied, no, in many homes in the Philippines. No. In terms of that, if it had such a strong impact no, on fuel efficiency and cooking, it would still be used today. No. In homes, you'll have fireless. Um, cookers, no, and it's not an, it's not a difficult uh, uh, tool to use, no. In fact, you can um, even use regular baskets, no, and just line it with cloth, no, um, and place your dish there until it cooks, no. And I think it's an interesting way of cooking. But um, yeah, no, I wanted to see whether this technology no, um, continued, no, um, and, and if it was extensively used outside of the classroom. Um, another interesting thing no, um, with technology no, is they taught us how to can and preserve food. No? And this was interesting because without being completely scientific about it, they actually taught us the science of food preservation. No? Not that I'm saying that we didn't have some kind of food preservation before. We already were developing a lot of fermented products, things like patis, no? and I think things like um, jams, no? local jams. No? But now they've added an element of hygiene and sanitation to it no? through the process of sterilization. No? And, um, and it's interesting because they had different techniques, no? Um, they had the hot back and the cold back method. They were also encouraging the use of um, local fruits and vegetables for preservation. No? Although when I was looking at it, it doesn't. When I looked at the recipes, no, some of them would boil green vegetables for twenty minutes, no, and that means that the whatever green vegetable you have, for example, pechay, no, if you want to preserve pechay, boiling it for 20 minutes no, means that it would be overly mushy already. No? But that was their suggestion. No? Alongside these very um, Western-oriented technology no, in terms of preservation, cookery, and um, so on, no? it was increasingly clear by 1919 that most Filipino homes do not have petroleum LPG uh, stoves. They didn't have ovens. And again, this is where a number of Filipino insight entered into the housekeeping pan one. No? And this is an example of um, a makeshift oven no? for quick breads. No? And for some of you who 
may be familiar with or have gone around, well, probably not this year, no, but um, in your lifetime, if you've gone around and saw a number of bibinka stalls, this kind no, of makeshift oven would look familiar to you. No? And so there's a lot of ingenuity, no? ingenuity that was introduced in the use of technology. No? If you don't have these materials, this is what you can do. No? Um, and I think it was important that by the time the Americans realized that um, not all Filipinos and not all schools can afford no, um, all of these modern Western luxuries, they now started to adapt the, the cooking practices in such a way that how can we teach hygiene and sanitation using cooking tools and utensils available in rural areas. So they were now thinking you know, of the furthest or the, what, the furthest areas that would probably not have access to ovens and so on. And many adapted cooking literacies using tools from the local kitchen. Many use novel cookery techniques to explore efficient food science applicable in local kitchens and useful you know, for food sustainability. You know? And of course, just as important, you know, safety in cooking, you know? especially whether you're using a new tool such as the LPG or something as old as this. You know? um, now let's look into the different techniques. You know? And again, um, their intent was really to maintain proper hygiene, sanitation, and nutrition in local cookery. They also wanted to offer clear instruction no, for hygienic food preparation no, and for the students to understand food and meals based on their nutritional value. No. Um, and what's interesting, no, and I will now stop using all of these black and white photos because you might be you might not find it appetizing to look at food that's black and white. So I borrowed some uh, common images online that are, you know, at least colored. No? Um, one thing interesting, no, in terms of food techniques, is that they, they were heavily relied on Western comforts. No? And I mentioned earlier that um, Alice Fuller, for example, all of her recipes, no, heavily relied, uh, most of her recipes, not all, relied on Western ingredients and preparation. No? So that banana salad with French, uh, banana heart salad no, with French dressing is an example. Um, they were promoting salads no, as the healthiest way to consume vegetables. No? Um, but uh, it's interesting to read no, Nick Joaquin's essay no, about his memoirs of his life during the American period. And he said, you know, we have an apathy for, to greens no, due to the poor quality of local varieties at the time. No? Um, one technique no, for eggplants no, um, is basically stuffing an eggplant. No? Um, and I chose this picture because it seems apparent that you can stuff an eggplant. But the way that they were describing no, um, how to stuff an eggplant, which involves scraping, the in, uh, boiling no, the eggplant for 10 minutes and then scraping the inside no, until you only have the skin left. No? With a thin eggplant like ours, no, it's impossible. If you think of the aubergine, the American eggplant, that is fully understandable. That technique is fully understandable. But as, as she describes, no, as Fuller described the recipe, I'm like, if I'm going to try this recipe, I'm quite sure nothing of my eggplant will be left no, um, for this supposed filling. No? And there were also interesting recipes no, such as sandwiches. Macaroni was introduced as an alternative carbohydrate for soups. No? Um, Going back to sandwiches, however, this was what you, what Nick Joaquin would say, uh, described as the joy no, of homemakers because suddenly entertaining people at home was a lot easier because you can easily prepare sandwiches. No? But of course, those sandwiches were only accessible to places where baking was fairly common and baking was commercialized. No? Um, so you have these highly you know, Western comforts in those recipes, but there were recipes that were in the middle ground. You know? And I found it fascinating that they use Southern Creole cuisine for these dishes. You know? Dishes like gumbo, jambalaya, um, rice and red kidney beans, you know? and okra soup you know, were included. And I think this is because the Americans were trying to figure out 
what are the dishes that have rice in it? No. Um, how can we uh, make sure that you know this is a meal that they can easily cook with what they have? And what and they were now kind of using their knowledge of the cuisines they have in the United States and our ingredients here at home. And their answer was to look into Southern Creole cuisine. Um, and what I found fascinating is that it didn't really stick. Um, I'm not sure quite a lot of Filipinos would know what a gumbo is. Um, in fact, I'm quite surprised that rice and red kidney beans as a dish together is not a staple. And I'm quite sure that there's a part of the population who would not be fond of the idea of an okra soup. No? And an okra soup is a very interesting Creole dish. No? Um, in fact, right in Abada, no, there's an African student who's selling okra soup. No? So do try it from there if you have time. Um, okay. And another thing no, that they were using um, the classroom for is that they were encouraging students to cook for the industry. No? So I did say earlier there were industrial crops and one of them was corn. No? And so I'm not saying that the Maha Blanca no, was created during that time. Probably no, I'm not sure. No, I have to find the roots of that. No? But certainly dishes such as this, no, whole cakes, um, were encouraged no, by the Americans. It's one of the recipes that they used to teach in class, no? to use um, corn no, as a main ingredient. No? But unfortunately, no, as some scholars would note, no, um, the Americans tried earnestly no, to introduce these ingredients to us, no, to encourage us to use no, corn in the same way that corn is utilized perhaps in Mexican cuisine. No? But for us, corn was heavily attached no, to poverty. No? It was basically used as gruel for li uh, livestock. No? Um, it's used as feed for livestock. No? And so it, we didn't, we weren't, really no, enamored by using corn. No. And hence, no, um, when I actually teach this in my normal class, no, I would tell them how many of you would actually remember or have a corn dish as your favorite dish. No? And usually I only have two students who would raise their hands and say either Maha Blanca or Mais Con Yelo as their favorite. No? And it, it somewhat shows no, that a legacy of corn not seen no, as um, an indulgent or a good luxurious food. No? Um, but one thing happened no, um, in these cookery manuals. No? Um, they started to champion local ingredients using American cookie, cookery literacies. No? So, um, well, when I look at Fuller's book, no, um, one of the things that I found interesting is that when she was building um, quite a number of menu, you know, she had a lot of recipes you know, for Mongo. You know? And um, while that, while Moringa, that whole Mongo fascination and that whole um, trend you know, surrounding Moringa hasn't really happened yet you know, at the time, but Mongo was considered, you know, an interesting and valuable food as early as the American period. And they were already encouraging consumption no, of this. No? And I think that's something no, that still resonated with us. No? And I think this is perhaps more of an indigenous dish that was integrated into the cookbooks. No? In the Butts edition, the 1919 edition of Housekeeping, no, you have things like pinakbet. No? And one thing that can be found valuable no, in these textbooks, what we must give credit to these textbooks, is their ability to, to document the process of preparing food. Recipe creation is not easy, more so hygienic recipe preparation. No? So you can see in this uh, and this recipe of pinakbet, it was important for them to mention that you have to wash the eggplants, you have to soak the eggplants, remove the seeds, and so on and so forth. You know? um, of course, these days, you know, um, cook until the vegetables are tender is a little more problematic. You know? And I think um, I was talking with uh, a friend before you know, that when you say something tender, because you know, I was 
teaching her how to cook. No? When I say something tender, it might not, your notion of tender might be different from my notion of tender. No? Um, and, but what's interesting though, in Filipino language, no, there are specific words. No? Um, is it malata? No? Is it um, uh, malam malambot? And so on and so forth. No? There are much more nuanced terms no? in Tagalog. And in fact, what happened here, no, because of the American recipes in the Fuller book, no, a lot of Filipino women started publishing no, their own cookbooks, which include a lot of Filipino you know, The name escapes me again. No? For, um, for example, um, we do have a collection of one of the first cookbooks involved a collection of mostly Filipino and Hispanic musicians. Um, Pas Kalaw, uh, Pas William Weber Kalaw there, um, wrote a recipe book that contained recipes from different parts of the Philippines. No, the book was initially in Spanish, so you can imagine that you know, um, it could have been extensively read. No, at least those for Filipinos who could understand Spanish. No, but eventually it was translated into Tagalog no, in a later edition. No? But nonetheless, it is because of these recipe books that uh, these um, housekeeping manuals that the Americans did that inspired um, Filipinos to also produce uh, their own recipe books and start systematically thinking about how they can um, present their food and prepare their food no, in a safe, delicious, and very indigenous and local manner. No? Um, one would think now with this no, that our taste has greatly diversified no um in those housekeeping manuals we had wonderful beverages no and of course they would talk about these different tools no for um producing these beverages no we had no commercial access to tea coffee chocolate was locally produced tea was also, uh, actually coffee was also locally produced no? and even other cold drinks no um these and I hope you can see it. No? Um, these kinds of diverse tastes no, can be seen in the different menus, no? suggested diet menus um, that these housekeeping manuals suggested. So here you'll have, um, this one is the fuller um, suggested um, menu no? for one person. No? You'll have drinks, coffee with milk in the morning, um, chocolate in the morning, um, rice milk with sliced bananas and sugar, hot bread, and so on and so forth. No, and here, no, it's this one is from the 1919 housekeeping book. No, um, and you have things like much more accessible ingredients like papaya, rice, hard boiled egg, chocolate, mongo. No, both menu would suggest mongo at various points in the day. Um, meat stew with vegetables, rice, mustard leaves, and so on. No. Um, here you'll even have like roast pork, mashed kamote, no, um, pomelo salad. And if I check the recipe, that also uses French dressing, um, and so on and so forth. No. So this is like a suggested menu, no, for people at the time. No. Um, the development of these recipes now um, had some very interesting combinations. No? So this is um, a recipe of kare kare, no? um, familiar ingredients, stems of squash, radishes, coconut, sitaw, so on and so forth, a try to see bagoong or salt. No? Um, perhaps what is quite unique no? is the use of coconut, no? or particularly coconut milk for kare kare. No? That's quite unheard of. I'm not sure if some of you are familiar with that kind of recipe, but for me, I haven't encountered a recipe of kare kare that uses coconut milk. No? And I would think that that is the response no, for richer um, for richer dish no? uh, for kare kare. No? Um, you also have simple staples that were introduced, things like the fried chicken, of course. Um, and again, no, this this seems to be quite accessible to us. 
kill me chicken, etc. But if you check the recipe for the gravy, to make the gravy, pour all the fat except one tablespoon full from the frying pan to the fat left in the pan and add one tablespoon of flour. Okay. Um, this is one of many flour dishes and mix thoroughly and add one cup of hot milk or one cup of coconut milk. No? So I'm not sure if any of you you have had the chance to taste um, gravy no? made with coconut milk, no? but it's certainly fun to try no? how that would taste like. No? Um, and then you also have regional favorites, no? such as the pancit. No? Um, Chinese cooking was, I was surprised no? to find Chinese dishes in the second edition of the cookbook, no? uh, of, sorry, of the housekeeping manual. No? Um, and I was looking at the previous manual, and as again, it was very much centered no, on American cooking. You would sooner see dumplings created in the technique of American dumplings, which is basically um, potato with flour, and then you boil it no, with some kind of stock. No? But by the time they created no, uh, the second housekeeping manual, they started introducing pancit. No? Um, but what I find fascinating is this particular pancit recipe or any of the recipes no, in, those, in both cookbooks or in both manuals does not contain toyo no, or soy sauce. No? And I wonder, you know, is it because you know, soy sauce did not arrive yet on our shores um, or is, was it really a post-war product? Um, perhaps that is a point of research no, some other time. No? Maybe Stuart might know better when it might have arrived no, in our shores. No? And of course, um, we had our indulgent legacies, no? um, things like Spanish dishes, Afritada, and so on, were also included no, in these cookbooks. Um, and one thing to note is that increasingly, no, um, the Bots cookbook, was a reflection no, of our diverse palette. No? Not necessarily one that was introduced by the Americans, but one that really captured no, um, the Filipino palette no, or the Filipino food culture. Um, although I'm not saying that it was the perfect recipe book, certainly no, um, there was still a lot of American influence there, but at the very least, there was space no, for young women to learn no, these recipes that are accessible to them, that are, um, that are manageable for them to do at any part of their lives or in their homes no, at any point or any place in the Philippines. No. So what's our lesson no, from the public school kitchen? No? Um, as you saw no, through the presentation, there were many instances no, where um, uh, the Americans tried to teach us their literacies, but things were just not working out. No? And I wanted to have a greater opportunity no, to look into these responses of the women. But again, no, because the libraries are closed, I could only piece some of them no, from different secondary sources. No? But it's interesting to note how a lot of our young women use food no, as a liberating literacy to critique American colonialization of their kitchens. They were absolutely refusing no they're, it's not that they're saying we shouldn't uh, follow no what the americans are teaching us being having healthy uh practices no um, clean sanitized practices in the kitchen is helpful no but it's not it doesn't make sense if it's for food that they don't eat for food that they cannot easily acquire for food that they cannot access no Another interesting thing that we've learned no, from the public school kitchen is that there was a democratization of taste. No? Even when these young girls could not afford the ingredients of a relleno dish or ingredients of gumbo, at the very least, they would have had a taste of it in school because the school would have provided these ingredients. No? So they start to understand flavors. No? They start to understand other dishes no, that they could possibly try in their school. No? One thing that's also interesting is that there was a modernization of indigenous cookery no, through sanitation and technology. No? Suddenly, all these girls were educated. How are you going to use an oven? How are you going to use an LPG stove? No? And if you are using you know, um, 
your old ovens, your old stoves that are wood fired and so on. How can you keep them clean? How can you keep your food, you know, without ashes and so on and so forth? No? And as these women were equipped with all of these wonderful literacies about cooking, they empowered young Filipino women who represent themselves no? um, in the kitchens to find their own space in the kitchens. Perhaps the only sad thing about this is that home economics box many women no? within the domestic, domestic trade. No? Um, and I'd like to end with this postscript no? of um, a 1939 census no? where we can see that in terms of percentages no, within the domestic no, and personal service, 63% of that were women. No? Um, and so you can see the success no, to a certain extent no, of the American education system and the industrial system. It was decided to, to give them the tools to work, no? but also look no, at how much a person who worked in the domestic services earned no? compared to someone who worked in agriculture, professional services, and so on and so forth. So imagine young mothers no, earning nine pesos no, for their work, um, trying to find medicines that cost two pesos, no, like um, tiki tiki, no, which was already available at the time, no, uh, would have cost around two pesos for just a bottle. No. Um, so I'd like to end my presentation there. I'd like to thank everyone. And if I didn't keep track no, of the chat no, but hopefully there are questions that I could answer later on so thank you everyone for your time